So in this lecture, we are going to discuss the problem of spam detection. As with the other sections of this course, which are focused on applications, we will split this up into two distinct lectures. This lecture will focus on describing the problem without discussing any solution. That is, our only goal in this lecture is to understand what spam detection is and why you'd want to do it. The next lecture will focus on one specific solution, and after that, we will look at how to implement that solution in Python. Now, one surprising fact I learned in V1 of this course is that not everybody knows what spam detection is. I personally found this very strange, but I guess my audience is more diverse than I assumed. So let me turn this over to you, the students. If you have never heard of spam detection before, please let me know either using the Q&A or emailing me directly from my website, lazyprogrammer.me. If after watching this lecture, you still do not know what spam detection is, then I invite you to tell me which parts you are having the most trouble understanding. That being said, let's move on to discussing spam detection. Okay, so what is spam detection? Well, in order to best understand spam detection, you must have some experience using email, text message, or some other kind of messaging service. So this lecture will assume you have such experience. If you do not, then it would be best to perhaps just spend some more time around your computer and experience these services for yourself. Okay, so what happens when you have some experience with email, text, and other messengers? Well, you learn that not every message you get is legitimate. A majority of the messages you receive should be from friends, family, colleagues, and other people you expect to hear from. But sometimes you will get strange messages from unknown people. Perhaps they are trying to sell you something. Perhaps they are trying to install malware on your machine by getting you to click a mysterious link. Perhaps they are trying to steal your credentials by pretending they are your bank or some other service you frequently use, such as Facebook. One classic scam is called the Nigerian Prince Scam, where the sender pretends to be a Nigerian prince. They tell you they have a large sum of money, which they need to move urgently out of their country, and for some reason they need your help. They might ask for your bank details so that they can deposit their money into your bank account, or they might ask you for a small advance payment. In exchange for your help, they will offer to let you keep a small part of their fortune. Of course, there is no money to be made because none exists, since as mentioned, it is a scam. Okay, so I hope the premise of a spam is clear. These are messages that you receive, but you do not want. Typically, they are from people who are trying to scam you or get something from you. So now that we know what spam is, I hope it's clear why we would want to detect spam. Although what constitutes spam seems obvious, remember that the reason that spammers and scammers even bother to send these messages is because some people do fall for it. Because of that, companies who run email services and email clients try to filter spam from your inbox. Of course, another obvious reason is that we simply do not want to see spam, even though we can detect it ourselves we would rather not be bothered by it in the first place. And just as a side note, this is an excellent example of how machine learning is used for automation. Sure, you could delete all your spam messages by yourself, but imagine how much time that would take. It would be better if a machine did that for us. And today that largely is the case. So at this point, I want to point out another common beginner mistake, which I saw in V1 of this course. So some students, for some reason, were confused about where spam detection fits in to an email application. Remember that the goal of this section is not to build a whole email service like Gmail or a whole email client like Thunderbird. That would be a pretty monumental task. You would need a whole team of people in probably months or years of time to do that with any success. Building an email service requires lots of other work, which is not relevant to us in a machine learning course, such as building the user interface, designing the database, and so forth. 
Basically, what you have to be comfortable with is building only a small part of a big computer program and knowing where it fits into that program without having to build the whole thing yourself. Of course, we do that every day in the real world if you work as a software engineer, but I realize some of you may not have that experience. So as always, if there is something you don't understand here, please use the Q&A to get that sorted. So for this class, what you can do is, pretend you are a software engineer at Gmail. Your job is to write a function. Remember that this is just a function. You don't have to write all of Gmail yourself. There are other people at Google working on Gmail with you. The function has a very simple interface. The function is called detect spam. The input into this function is a document, which represents the text of an email, SMS message, or any other kind of message. The output from this function is just a binary value. Suppose we return one if the input was spam and zero if it was not spam. In the rest of this section, we will look at how to write such a function. And remember, every other part of the Gmail program, like the user interface, the web server, and so forth, will be written by your team members. So your job is only to write this one small function, which is part of a bigger code base. So in this lecture, we will be looking at the intuition behind Naive Bayes. Now, in order to understand Naive Bayes, we must first understand Bayes' rule. So this lecture will assume that you have at least a passing knowledge of probability, which you should as per the instructions for this course. So let's begin by reviewing Bayes' rule. Suppose that we have two random variables, x and y. Now, if you're concerned that these are just abstract variables, please do not worry, as we will be doing examples very shortly. So let's also suppose that we want to know p of y given x. Note that this is a conditional distribution because y is conditioned on x. Now, suppose that we are given p of x given y, and also the marginal distribution p of y. If this is the case, then we can express what we want to know in terms of what we do know using Bayes' rule. So on the numerator, we have p of x given y times p of y, and on the denominator, we have the same thing, except summed over all possible values of y. And just as a reminder, recall that the numerator can be simplified to p of x and y, while the denominator can be simplified to p of x. So that should give you some intuition about why Bayes' rule is the way it is. Now, let's discuss Bayes' rule in terms of classification for machine learning. In this case, the input to the model is x, while the target is y. So these variables are no longer abstract, but represent something we want to measure. For example, y could be whether or not an email is spam, while x could be the email itself. Note that in this context, because we are not doing regression, y is a discrete or categorical random variable. As such, although we write p of y given x, note that this is not one value, but a whole distribution. So for example, if y can take on the values spam and not spam, then we might find that p of y equals spam given x is equal to 0 0.3, while p of y equals not spam given x is equal to 0 0.7. So the number of probabilities in the distribution is the number of classes we have. Furthermore, note that this makes it easy to formulate a decision rule. We simply pick the class which has the highest probability. Mathematically, we choose the class k star, which is the argmax of p of y given x, over all values of y. So in our example above, we would choose not spam, since 0 0.7 is bigger than 0 0.3. Now, it's important to remember not to be overwhelmed by math symbols, if you happen to have any math phobias. Intuitively, this rule makes perfect sense. If the probability of an email being not spam is bigger than the probability of that email being spam, of course I'm going to classify it as not spam. In fact, we can think of an even more intuitive example. Suppose that you're about to play a game, say betting on a horse race. 
Luckily, I have insider knowledge and I can tell you the probability that each horse will win. So suppose that there are six horses. Horse number one has a 50% chance of winning, while all the other horses have a 10% chance. Note that you only get to play once, and you must bet all your money on a single horse. In this case, you should pick horse number one instead of any of the other horses, because it has the best chance to win. So hopefully that's pretty intuitive. Okay, so now that you understand the basics of the decision rule, let's go through a full example where both X and Y represent concrete things. Suppose that Y represents whether or not a patient will have a severe immune reaction to COVID. We could think of that as whether or not they need to go to the hospital. So I hope that you'll find this example very intuitive, as it is pretty contemporary, and hopefully you've read about these factors in the news. If you haven't, please let me know in the Q&A, and I'll be happy to share some news articles with you. In any case, note that this is categorical. We can denote the classes as severe and mild. For this initial example, suppose that X is just one measurement, which is the patient's BMI. As you recall, BMI stands for body mass index, which is more or less your weight divided by your height. It is a common but flawed measurement of one's body fat. However, for this example, I think it's the easiest to understand. So given this information, we can now write down how to compute the probabilities we previously discussed. Remember that we know all the values on the right side, and we want to find the value on the left side, after which we can use those values to make a prediction. Note that we call the distribution on the left side the posterior. So it may be helpful to think about how each of the values on the right side will be measured. For P severe and P mild, note that these are called priors. They represent the rate of severe or mild reactions given no other information. That is, they are conditioned on nothing. In practice, they would simply be computed by counting. So for example, if you have 1,000 COVID patients and 100 of them had severe reactions, then that means P severe is 10%, and thus P mild would be 90%. Now let's consider P of BMI given severe and P of BMI given mild. Note that these are called likelihoods. So one plausible solution is to model these as Gaussian. As you recall, the Gaussian, or normal distribution, is the famous bell curve. Recall that it is fully specified by its mean and variance. Thus, what you would want to do is collect all the severe patients and compute the mean and variance of their BMI. This would fully specify the Gaussian distribution, P of BMI given severe. Of course, we could do a similar thing for the mild patients as well, and that would give us P of BMI given mild. Now, because this is just an intuition lecture, we're not going to go through any calculations, but feel free to do that on your own if you feel the need to try it out. Now, typically in machine learning, we don't just have one input. In the previous example, our only input was BMI. However, it may be the case that we could make more accurate predictions by using more information about the patient. As you recall, Age is a major factor as well. So suppose X is now a vector with multiple components, one for BMI and one for age. Of course, the computations we would do are basically the same as what I've shown you so far. The only difference is that everywhere you previously saw only BMI, now you see BMI and age. So what is naive Bayes, and how is that different from simply using Bayes' rule? This all has to do with the form of the likelihood. Continuing on with our example, that would be P of BMI and age, given Y. Note that we're just using Y as a generic variable, which in this example could represent severe or mild. So as we've discussed it so far, this is a very general way of looking at things. We haven't said anything about the structure of this distribution. It could be Gaussian, exponential, or any other kind of multivariate distribution, even one that we do not know how to compute. The most important fact to pay attention to is that BMI and age do not have to be independent, which makes sense. 
it could very well be that BMI is affected by age. That is, as one ages, perhaps it becomes more difficult to control BMI. Well, what makes this naive Bayes is that we make the naive Bayes assumption. The naive Bayes assumption is that all the inputs are independent. Essentially, this makes everything easier to compute, and as engineers, we have no problem making potentially unrealistic assumptions if they make things easier to compute. Now, one common way to visualize the naive Bayes model is with a graphical model. Personally, I don't find this that useful, but perhaps you might. So in this case, each circle represents a random variable, and each arrow represents a dependency. In this case, we can see that all of the x's are dependent on y. This makes sense. For example, if y is severe, then you could imagine that the input for age would be larger on average. Thus, age is affected by y, taking on a certain value. Importantly, note that all the x's are independent of each other. That is, there are no arrows going from any x to any other x. In this diagram, the x's represent each individual component of our input. So in our COVID example, we would have two x's, one representing BMI and one representing age. In general, we will just have x1, x2, and so forth up to xd, where d is the number of input features of our data set. Okay, so as mentioned, what makes naive Bayes naive is that it assumes that all the inputs are independent. However, this still doesn't say anything about what kind of distribution we should use for p of x given y. In fact, this is totally up to you. However, if you choose something exotic or unconventional, note that you would have to implement it yourself. In fact, it's not even required that all the x's come from the same kind of distribution. Perhaps it's the case that x1 is Gaussian, but x2 is exponential, and x3 is Bernoulli, and so forth. But in scikit-learn, there are predefined naive Bayes models, which use specific likelihood distributions. These are the Gaussian, the multinomial, and the Bernoulli. Note that, for these pre-built models, all the x's come from the same kind of distribution. For example, if you choose Gaussian naive Bayes, that will mean all your x's will be Gaussian. Of course, your next question will be, well, which one do I choose for my specific problem? And of course, that depends on the distribution of your data. If your data is continuous and looks like a bell curve, then the Gaussian would be a good choice. If you have count data that comes from a categorical, then the multinomial would be a good choice. Note that this is typically the correct option for NLP, and specifically count vectors or TFIDF. And if your data is binary, then Bernoulli would be a good choice. This might be applicable if you choose the binary version of count vectors for NLP. So in this lecture, I will be giving you an official exercise prompt in preparation for the next lecture. As with the other exercises in this course, please feel free to look at the official notebook in order to get the data set, but please do not cheat by looking at the whole solution. So the exercise can be described quite simply. What you are going to get is a data set of SMS messages, which are labeled as spam or not spam. Your job, of course, is to build a classifier and assess its accuracy on both the train and test sets. Note that because the data set is just a single file, you will need to split the data into train and test yourself. So let's go through some additional details that may help you complete the exercise. Firstly, note that it will be your choice which vectorization strategy you want to use. As you recall, this will include tokenization as well. You may choose the count vectorizer with default settings, or even TFIDF with stop words and lemmatization and normalization and so forth. So that is up to you. As your classifier, you should choose an appropriate form of naive Bayes, either writing it yourself or using scikit-learn, depending on how advanced you want to go. Furthermore, you should feel free to try other classifiers as well. Finally, you'll want to check the performance of your model. 
Note that by default, when you call the score function in scikit-learn, this returns the accuracy. However, recall that this is not an ideal scoring function when the classes are imbalanced. Thus, you should check whether the classes are imbalanced in order to determine if other scoring functions are necessary to use. Some examples of scoring functions that take into account class imbalance are the F1 score and the AUC. So in this lecture, we will be discussing the concept of class imbalance and some typical methods for dealing with that in machine learning. So let's begin by discussing why class imbalance is a problem. Suppose that you are developing a blood test for some disease. Thus, you are essentially building a binary classifier where the output is either a disease or no disease. It should be noted that diseases by nature are generally rare in the population. Otherwise, a large portion of people would be walking around in a diseased state. Suppose that for the disease in question, it is only present in 0.1% of the population, and thus 99.9% .9 do not have the disease. Now, suppose that the classifier we build is very bad, such that it doesn't really do any computation except for returning no disease for every input. This illustrates the problem with using accuracy as a metric. You see, even with this bad classifier, you would still end up getting 99.9% .9 accuracy simply because that is the percentage of people who do not have the disease. And this is assuming that the testing for this disease is indiscriminate. That is, everyone in the population has an equal chance of being tested, regardless of their symptoms. This is probably not realistic, but let's just assume that it's true. So what can be done about this issue? Well, we can start by looking at the results in a more detailed manner in order to understand where we are going wrong. In particular, there are four quantities we're interested in looking at instead of just one. These are the true positives, the true negatives, the false positives, and the false negatives. So these should be pretty intuitive. We first have to decide which class is positive and which is negative. So for this example, let's assume that testing positive for the disease is equivalent to the positive class. In this case, the number of true positives is the number of people who have the disease that we correctly predicted have the disease. On the other hand, the number of false positives is the number of people we predicted to have the disease but do not really have the disease. Similarly, the number of true negatives is the number of people who do not have the disease and we correctly predicted that they do not have the disease. And the number of false negatives is the number of people who we predicted to not have the disease but really do have the disease. Oh, and if you noticed, we typically organize these numbers in a table. In particular, we call this a confusion matrix. Note that a confusion matrix is more general and can be extended to any number of classes. However, the following techniques in this lecture will be focused on the binary case. Although they can be extended to the multi-class case, they don't naturally fit into that picture. And thus, for the rest of this lecture, let's assume that we're talking about binary classification. So how can we make use of the numbers we've collected so far? Well, historically, there have been a few ways to do this, and whatever you use tends to depend on what field you come from. So if you're in the medical field or life sciences, you tend to report the sensitivity and specificity. The sensitivity is the true positive rate. It is equal to the number of true positives divided by the total number of positives, hence true positive rate. It is the rate at which we can detect those who are positive for the disease. Another way to think of this is, out of however many actual positives, this is the percentage of those positives you will be able to detect. Note that, in terms of the four counts we collected, it is equal to the number of true positives divided by the number of true positives plus the number of false negatives. As you recall, the false negatives also have the disease. The second item is the specificity. This is the true negative rate. 
as you might be able to guess, it is equal to the number of true negatives divided by the total number of negatives, hence true negative rate. It is the rate at which we can detect those who are negative for the disease. And again, you can derive this to be the number of true negatives divided by the number of true negatives plus the number of false positives. Again, the false positives are among those who do not have the disease. So let's think about what would happen to the sensitivity and specificity if we used our very bad classifier, which always predicts no disease. Suppose there are n people in our study. As mentioned, 0.001n of these people have the disease, while 0.999n do not. Now, since we always predict no disease, this means that we have 0.999n true negatives. We also have 0.001n false negatives. We have no true positives because we never predict positive. And we also have no false positives since we never predict positive. Because of this, the sensitivity is equal to 0 divided by 0 plus 0.001n, which is just 0. This is because we have no true positives. On the other hand, the specificity is equal to 0.999n divided by 0.999n plus 0, which is 1. This makes sense because we correctly predicted everyone who does not have the disease by always predicting no disease. So how does this help? Well, note that we now have two numbers to measure the performance of our predictor. Previously, we only had accuracy, which was at 99.9%, .9%, which seems good when it is really not. But by using two numbers, they both give us an indication of how the model is performing by looking at the two classes separately. In this case, the specificity is 1, which is a good sign, but the sensitivity is 0, which is a bad sign. If you measured the performance of your predictor and it had poor sensitivity, you would immediately know that it is failing to detect the disease. And thus, unlike accuracy, this could be used as a measure of how useful your model would be in the real world. To understand this, let's continue with our example of trying to predict whether or not a patient has some disease. The sensitivity tells us how good we are at detecting the disease in people who actually have the disease. Of course, we want this to be high so that we can provide treatment to these patients. We would not want to leave them untreated, which is what a bad predictor would do by predicting no disease for every patient. On the other hand, we want our specificity to also be high. As an extreme example, we don't want to tell everyone that they have the disease because they don't actually need treatment. Now, in practice, typically what happens is not that you treat the patient upon seeing a positive test, but rather you do further tests to confirm the diagnosis. At the same time, you don't want to scare patients by telling them that they have the disease when they really do not. Now, it's worth thinking about what the sensitivity and specificity would be if our model made perfect predictions. In this case, the number of false positives is zero, and the number of false negatives is also zero. So the sensitivity is TP over TP plus FN, which is equal to TP over TP, which is one. Likewise, the specificity is TN over TN plus FP, which is equal to TN over TN, which is also one. Therefore, the true positive rate is one, and the true negative rate would also be one. Thus, what we are aiming for when we build a binary classifier is for both the sensitivity and specificity to be 1. In the case of our very bad classifier, we got 0 for the sensitivity, which is very bad. Now, as mentioned, the metrics you use tend to be influenced by your field of study. I personally find the sensitivity and specificity to make a lot of sense, but in NLP, we tend to use precision and recall. Intuitively, you can always remember what these mean because they are named for their use in document retrieval. So let's start with recall. The recall happens to be the same thing as the sensitivity, that is the true positive rate. In terms of document retrieval or search engines, it would be the number of relevant documents you found out of the total number of documents you should have found. In other words, it's the percentage of documents you were able to recall. Now, the precision is a little bit different. 
This is also known as the positive predictive value. It's equal to the ratio of true positives to true positives plus false positives. In other words, it's equal to the number of documents you correctly retrieved divided by the total number of documents you retrieved. So why does this make sense? Well, suppose you built a very bad document retrieval system that just returned all the documents every time. Sure, this would include the documents you wanted, but also tons of documents which you did not want. Hence, it would be imprecise. The number of false positives would be very high. On the other hand, if you can reduce the number of false positives to zero and stop returning irrelevant documents, then you would be very precise. If the number of false positives is zero, then the precision would be equal to true positives over true positives, which would be one. Hence, this ratio is known as the precision. How precise were you in returning relevant documents? So we just discussed two methods of measuring the performance of a binary classifier when we have imbalanced classes. One option is to use sensitivity and specificity, while the other is to use precision and recall. Note that there is one crucial way that these differ from accuracy, which is the typical performance metric. And that is, these give us back two numbers instead of just one. The problem is, this might make it too complicated when it comes to making decisions about which model is best. For example, suppose you're comparing two models, but one does better with precision, while the other does better with recall. How can you choose which model is best? Well, one way to answer this question is to distill these metrics back into a single number. So one method of getting a single number out of the precision and recall is to use the F1 score. Essentially, the F1 score is the harmonic mean of the precision and recall. Now, you don't have to worry about what that is, but I'll show you the formula in case you ever need to implement it yourself. Essentially, it's just two times the product of precision and recall divided by the sum of precision and recall. So just think of the F1 score as a way to take the average of these two numbers. Now, if you're curious, recall that the regular mean is where you add up all the numbers and divide by n. The harmonic mean is where you first invert all the numbers, then add together, then divide by n, and then invert them back. So a simple way to think about it is that it's just another way of computing the mean. So the F1 score is some kind of mean of the precision and recall. So in this lecture, we will continue our discussion on class imbalance. Now, there's one final metric I want to discuss, which comes from the era of radar in the field of estimation and detection. This is where many of the statistical methods we use today were invented. So one helpful plot that was used was the receiver operating characteristic, or the ROC curve. This curve is a plot of the true positive rate on the y-axis and the false positive rate on the x-axis. Note that the false positive rate is just one minus the true negative rate. So a typical ROC curve will go up and to the right, and it will be steep on the left side while being more flat on the right side. So let's think about how this type of curve arises. The main idea behind the ROC is that your decision rule can be based on a threshold. And where you define that threshold to be will affect these true positive and false positive rates. Now, we haven't really discussed this yet, but there is typically a trade-off between specificity and sensitivity. In particular, suppose that our sensitivity is low. That is, the number of true positives is low because we're not catching enough of the positives. So perhaps your job is to detect enemy ships on your radar, and you're letting too many of them slip by. In other words, our detector is not sensitive enough. In that case, we can simply make it more sensitive by lowering the threshold of detection. Normally, we would choose the positive class if the probability of that class is bigger than 50%. However, we don't have to use this as a threshold. Instead, we could pick 40% or 30%. 
By doing this, our classifier will make more positive detections, hopefully increasing the number of true positives. The trade-off is that this won't be perfect. We could end up having more false positives as well. This will increase the false positive rate, or in other words, decrease the specificity. So that brings us back to the ROC. Basically, the ROC is formed by letting this threshold of detection go all the way from 0% up to 100%. At 0%, we will predict that everything is positive, so our true positive rate will be 1, and our false positive rate will also be 1. This is because we will always predict 1. Since our threshold is 0%, and any number output by our model will be greater than 0%, then our model will always predict 1. So we catch all the true positives, or the enemy ships, but all the negatives will be predicted as positive as well. At 100%, our true positive rate will be 0, and our false positive rate will also be 0. In this case, we never predict positive, so we never detect any enemy ships. But on the other hand, we never falsely identify something which is not an enemy ship as an enemy ship. The interesting part of the ROC is its shape. Typically, we draw a line from the bottom left corner up to the top right corner. This line is the benchmark for random guessing. That is to say, this model would be very dumb and just output a random probability for every input sample. As an exercise, I recommend thinking about why that would yield a straight line in the ROC. Now, with this line as our benchmark, we can now start to think about what kind of ROC we actually want to see. Well, what we want to see, as you can probably tell, is a curve that goes to the top left of our benchmark. The more top left it can go, the better it is. Let's think about why that is the case. To understand this, let's think about the extreme case, where the ROC shoots up to 1 immediately and stays there. What does this mean? This means that no matter what my threshold is, my true positive rate is perfect. Therefore, I can drive my false positive rate down to 0, while still keeping my true positive rate at 1. Furthermore, as you recall, a false positive rate of 0 corresponds to a specificity of 1. Therefore, in this case, our classifier is perfect for both classes and does not make any mistakes. Both the sensitivity and specificity are 1. Of course, in reality, for most practical data sets, the curve will be below this perfect case. Now, here's something to think about. We've been talking about metrics. Our goal was to quantify the performance of a model with a single number. But we seem to have made things worse by introducing a plot that you have to look at. We seem to have gone in the opposite direction as what we intended. Of course, we are still not done. In fact, we can get a single number from this plot. This single number is called the AUC, or the area under the curve. As you might expect, it is simply the area underneath the ROC curve. Note that both the height and the width of this box is 1. Therefore, the area of the box is also 1. Now, because the total area of the box is 1, that means a perfect AUC is 1. It covers the whole area of the box. Note that the benchmark splits the box in 2, and thus the benchmark for random guessing is 0.5. Thus, your model's AUC is hopefully larger than 0.5, and ideally you want it to be close to 1. So this is another alternative to the F1 score. So here's one complication of the AUC method that makes it a bit more complex to use compared to the F1 score. In particular, this is that it requires your model to output probabilities. Specifically, the model needs to output p of y equals 1 given x. This is assuming that your classes are assigned the values 0 and 1, and that 1 is the positive class. As you recall, this is needed since the ROC is formed by applying different thresholds from 0 up to 1. So for example, if the threshold is 0.3 and the model outputs 0.4, then we would assign that sample to the positive class. But if the threshold were 0.5, then we would assign that same sample to the negative class. So the model must be able to output this posterior probability. 
Now, it's worth discussing how one usually does this in the most popular Python library for machine learning, which is scikit-learn. Note that if you're implementing models yourself, then this would be obvious. But if you're using scikit-learn, it may not be obvious if you're not familiar with the API. So it's worth reviewing how this works. So normally, when you call model.predict in scikit-learn, you get back an n-length one-dimensional array, assuming that you have n input samples. If you have k classes, then this array will contain integers from 0 up to k minus 1. So this is the typical way to get a prediction in scikit-learn. The question is, how do we get probabilities? The answer is to call a different function, which is usually called predict proba. Now keep in mind, scikit-learn is another library, which is part of the NumPy stack, which means it is constantly changing from month to month and year to year. So while this is the case today, it may not be the case forever. In any case, what can we expect from this function? Well, supposing again that we have n samples in k classes, we will get back a two-dimensional array of size n by k. This time, the array values are not integers, but floating point numbers. And furthermore, these floating point numbers are probabilities. In particular, if we call the output p, then pnk will be the posterior probability that the nth sample belongs to class k. In other words, mathematically, it is p of y sub n equals k given x sub n. Note that, because of this convention, each row of this array will sum to 1, since each row of the matrix is a separate probability distribution. Now, back to the binary case specifically. As you recall, we want to know the probability that the class is equal to 1, and since the output is binary, there are only two columns in the matrix. In this case, we want the second column, or the column at index 1, since the first column corresponds to the probability for class 0. So putting this all together, here is how we would compute the AUC in scikit-learn from a trained binary model. First, suppose we have our target array, which is called Y. This array contains only the integers 0 and 1. Suppose we have a corresponding input matrix called X. What we need to do is get the predictions for X by calling model.predictProba passing in X. This will give us the posterior probabilities, which we will call p. As you recall, p is an n by 2 matrix. Since we only want the probabilities for class 1, we will grab the column at index 1. Finally, we will pass y and the column at index 1 for p into the function called ROC AUC score. This will then return a single number, which is the AUC. Now, as a final side note, it's worth mentioning that not all classifiers in scikit-learn have a function called predict-proba. This is simply due to how certain classifiers work. Some algorithms simply do not output probabilities. One example of this is the perceptron. Another example is the support vector machine, although there is an ad hoc method to obtain probabilities, which has some issues. In particular, the probabilities may not be consistent with the predictions, and this method does not scale well for large datasets. On the other hand, since neural networks naturally output probabilities, using the AUC for imbalanced classes in deep learning is typically a fine choice. So in this lecture, I'm going to walk you through the exercise for classifying the SMS spam dataset and a few extra things that I think will help you understand the data. So hopefully you had a chance to try this out before watching this lecture. So the first thing we're going to look at is our list of imports. Note that most of this should be familiar. Some notable additions are the ROC AUC score, F1 score, and the confusion matrix. In addition, we'll also be using the word cloud library, which will let us visualize the most common words from each class. This will be helpful in understanding why our model behaves the way it does. In other words, why it thinks an email is spam or not spam.
The next step is to download the data. Next, I'm going to load in the data. As usual, since we have a CSV, we're going to use the pandas read CSV function. Also, notice I'm passing in a special encoding here called ISO 8859-1. Knowing what this is isn't important, but the reason why we need it is because the CSV contains some invalid characters. So if you try to use the default encoding, you're going to get an error that there's a character that's not valid in UTF-8. Generally, when you're working with text, you're going to come across invalid characters, especially these days with the existence of emojis and other non-standard symbols. Okay, so the next step is to do a df.head to see what our data frame looks like. So as you may have expected, we have two columns, one for the labels and one for the text. Now, for some reason, after you load in the CSV, you're going to see some extra columns that are just empty. So what we're going to do is clean up this data frame a little bit by dropping these columns. So here we have some code to drop the unwanted columns. The next step is to do a df.head again to see what the result is. Okay, so now you can see that our unwanted columns are gone. The next step is to rename the columns we kept, which are currently just V1 and V2, which are not really descriptive names. So we're going to rename them to labels and data. The next step is to do a df.hat again to ensure that our data frame is in the format we want it to be in. Okay, so now our data frame looks a lot better than it was before. The next step is to draw a histogram of our labels. This will help us determine whether or not we have imbalanced classes. Okay, so as you can see, in this case, we do have imbalanced classes. In particular, ham is much more common than spam. So it will make sense to look at other metrics, such as the F1 score and the AUC. So the next step is to create a new column called B labels, which assigns a value of zero to ham and a value of one to spam. We're also going to extract this column as a NumPy array. Note that you probably don't need to do this since last I remember, scikit-learn accepts data frames and series as input arguments and it allows your labels to be strings. But if you were to write your own model, you'd want the labels to be represented numerically. So in general, it's good practice to do this. The next step is to call train test split to split up our data into train and test. Note that you could even do cross-validation, so you can calculate, on average, how well the model does on the validation set. That's probably a more accurate measure than just one train test split. Okay, so the next step is to create our X matrix, which contains the input features for every sample. For this experiment, I'm going to use the count vectorizer from scikit-learn, which just gives you the raw counts. I have code here for TFIDF that's commented out in case you want to try that too. Notice how I'm passing in this decode error argument set to ignore. This is because, as I mentioned earlier, if any invalid UTF-8 characters are found, we want to just ignore them. The next step is to just print out Xtrain to see what we got back. Okay, so we get back a sparse matrix instead of the usual NumPy array where you can see all the numbers. As you recall, this is because the array contains a lot of zeros, and so this is the most efficient format to store the data in. Okay, so now that we have our data, training the model and evaluating the model is super simple. We just call the objects constructor, then we call the fit function, and then we call the score function for both train and test. 
Okay, so we do pretty well, about 98% accuracy on the test set. One interesting thing you can try later is to use TFIDF or use a different classifier and see if the results improve. Okay, so recall that our classes are imbalanced and thus accuracy may not be the best measure of performance. It could be the case that our model is just predicting ham all the time since that is the overrepresented class. In order to make sure that this is not the case, we should check other metrics. The first alternative metric we're going to try is the F1 score. To do this, we're first going to get our model's predictions for both train and test, which we'll call P train and P test. Note that we've assigned these to variables since they will be used again later in this notebook. The next step is to call the F1 score function, passing in the targets and the corresponding predictions for both train and test. Okay, so as you can see, the F1 score is in the 90s for both train and test, which is a good sign that our model is performing well for both classes. It's another way of saying that both precision and recall are good, since as you recall, the F1 score is the harmonic mean of these two. In the next block, we're also going to check the AUC as yet another alternative measure of performance. As you recall, this function requires our model's posterior probabilities, so we need to call the predict proba function. In addition, we want the columns at index 1, since these represent the probabilities for class 1. We'll assign these to the variable names prob train and prob test. The next step is to call the ROC AUC score function, passing in the targets along with the corresponding model probabilities for both train and test. So as you can see, our model does very well on this measure, obtaining close to one for both train and test. The next step is to see if we can get a more fine-grained view of our model's performance by looking at the confusion matrix. Note that we don't have to compute these ourselves since there's a function in scikit-learn that can do this for us. However, if you did want to compute this yourself, it would be quite simple. So please try that as an exercise if you would like. Okay, so as you can see, this only returns an array, which is not that useful to look at. You can probably guess based on these numbers what each entry means, but that would be unideal. Instead, a better method is to plot the confusion matrix. Now, normally you can do this in scikit-learn, and that is the case right now. However, you'll notice this comment I made here, which explains the situation. Basically, at the time I've made this lecture, scikit-learn version 1 is out. But as is typical with these data science Python libraries, these updates come with breaking changes. Unfortunately, the confusion matrix is one of those breaking changes, as the function to plot the confusion matrix has been moved. Unfortunately, this new version of scikit-learn is not currently easy to install in Colab, so we won't be looking at the new way to do this in this lecture. Now, breaking changes tend to always confuse a lot of beginners, so it's also not good to use the current version either. The solution for this notebook is to simply implement a confusion matrix plot ourselves with the help of Seaborn and Pandas. As an exercise, I would recommend looking up the new way to do this in scikit-learn as of version 1 and to try that out on your own machine. In any case, you can see that we've defined a function called plotcm, which takes in a confusion matrix as input. Inside the function, we define a list of classes, which are just ham and spam. The next step is to convert the confusion matrix into a pandas data frame, which is useful because both the columns and the rows can have names. In particular, we are going to name them by their class names, which will show up on our plot. The next step is to call the seaborn heat map function with several arguments to make it show annotations and to format the numbers correctly. The final step in this function is to label the axes so we know which one corresponds to the prediction and which one corresponds to the target. After defining the plotcm function, we're going to call the plotcm function on our train confusion matrix.
Okay, so as you can see, it looks about right. On the diagonal, which represents correct predictions, we have the largest numbers. On the off diagonals, we have relatively small numbers. Note that this goes for both classes. So we rarely predict ham as spam, and we rarely predict spam as ham. The next step is to plot the confusion matrix for the test set as well. So again, we see the same pattern where most of the predictions are correct for both classes. This makes sense in light of our high F1 scores and AUCs. So in this example, because we have access to the raw data, there's some interesting stuff we can do. So I've created this function called visualize. What this is going to do is create a word cloud. Basically, that's a picture where more frequent words appear larger and less frequent words appear smaller. So for each of the classes, we'll be able to see what are the most common words in a spam message? What are the most common words in a ham message? So this function takes in a label, which can be either ham or spam. We then grab only the rows that contain that label, and we loop through the data column. We keep a running string of each message we encounter and just concatenate them together. This is because that's what the word cloud library expects to get as input. So once we create the word cloud, we then use matplotlib to show it. So let's run this block. Okay, so let's first call this on the spam data. Okay, so we see that some of the common spam words are text, call now, free, mobile, call, text, and so forth. So that makes a lot of sense. So now let's call our function on the ham data. So here we see that the common words for ham are love, will, okay, now, go, and so forth. So it's a lot different than the spam messages. Okay, so in this next block of code, we're going to do a simple analysis to figure out what our model is getting wrong. There shouldn't be too many examples since we're getting about 98-99% accuracy. So we create a new column called predictions, and we set it to the predictions generated by our trained model. The next step is to create a variable called sneaky spam. It's sneaky spam because it's able to bypass our spam filter. So to do this, I need to filter the data frame by selecting any rows where the prediction is zero, but the true label is one. So we use that element wise and operation. So if you don't know how to do this, now you know. Then we loop through the data field and print each message. So here are some sneaky spam messages. Okay, so we have free message, hey there darling, did you hear about the new divorce Barbie? Uh, do you realize that in about 40 years? Okay, so you can see from this that some of these are obviously spam and some of them are not quite obviously spam. So overall, it's a mixture of the two. Okay, so in the next block of code, we're going to create another variable called not actually spam, since these are messages that our spam classifier detects as spam, but are actually legitimate messages. So it's the same process as before, except I've switched the zero and the one. So here are some not actually spam messages. Okay, so what's very interesting about this is that, um, Apparently these are not spam, but if you read these messages, like, hey, great deal, farm tour, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so for a lot of these, you can actually understand why these might be considered spam. It actually makes a lot of sense why these would be misclassified. So for example, unlimited text, limited minutes. So that could be something that was actually spam or something that your friend is sending you to give you some information. 
you also have stuff like this at the bottom where, you know, we have sent JD for customer service. So that actually looks like a spam message. So perhaps some of the rows are mislabeled. 